welcome to today's session on leadership in a new age. I'm Janet Pao, and I'm the executive director of the Asia Business Council, which is co-hosting the session today with Asia Society Hong Kong. And I want to thank our members and their senior colleagues from businesses around Asia uh, uh, in joining and also welcome the Asia Soci Society members and guests as well. So tonight we have two very strong female leaders in business with us, Geraldine Buckingham and Dee Poon. So now I think we all know that we're living in times of great uncertainty and the pace of change is really accelerating. So our speakers today will dive into a very lively conversation about what it takes to lead through these uncertainties and the crises, how to also build a pipeline for female leadership uh, in the future and also what leadership in the workplace uh, means. So I hope this will be a very valuable discussion for current and future leaders um, among our audience. And I hope that you will share your questions and comments uh, with the speakers as well. And um, I think uh, in the chat, you will see that participants can submit questions for Geraldine and Dee through the Slido link. I'm pleased to now introduce Geraldine Buckingham, who was previously BlackRock's chair and head of Asia Pacific, and also a member of the firm's Global Executive Committee. Dr. Buckingham has been recognized in various very prestigious lists as a leader, and she was also a partner at McKinsey. Uh, she's a Rhodes Scholar and also a medical doctor. Dee Poon is Managing Director of Brands and Distribution at SKL Group, which has been a leader in sustainability for many decades. And she's also very involved in arts and culture in Hong Kong and internationally as the board member of the West Kowloon Cultural District Authority and also M Plus Museum here in Hong Kong. And she is in various advisory roles at top global institutions in the arts and also universities, including Harvard and Oxford. So now let me turn the time over to Dee. Thank you, Janet, and hello, Geraldine. So Hi, Dee, good to see you. So good to see you. It's been a long time since we've been in person, and we just got off the practice site where we found out that we've, or I just realized that Geraldine has probably been on four continents in the last <laughs> month or so. Is that right? That's uh, I think I think certainly three. Um, I, I must say it feels both good and strange to be traveling internationally again. So I guess let's just jump right in, right? Um, yeah. What, maybe we start with a definition. What is leadership? Oh gosh, I think that's a, that's a very, very uh, good question. I don't think it's, I don't think it's one that has a, a simple answer. I think leadership comes in um, different forms. When I think about uh, the leaders that I have found compelling to work with, um, I think they have shared a few features in common. Uh, the thing I have found most inspiring in leaders is a real sense of authenticity, uh, a real sense that someone may be in a senior position or a leadership position. They don't try to pretend they have all the answers. They don't try to... Um, uh, appear like they're sort of you know a robot who doesn't have feelings or challenges or any of those sorts of things, but also balances that vulnerability um, with a sense of control and command that someone, particularly in times of crisis, uh, you feel has a sort of steady hand, um, is open to ideas but not afraid to make decisions, um, and ultimately can not just solve a problem themselves but actually rally people, work, create teams um, to get to the best outcome and the best answer even though it may well be that that leader is themselves not necessarily generating the idea or the answer, but they're able to move that team towards uh, the right outcome. Uh, but I think that that feature of authenticity, which I touched on first, is certainly over the years, as I've worked in different sectors in different parts of the world, um, it's leaders who've come across as very authentic that I've personally found most compelling to work with. So given with everything that's going on in the world, how do you think what's happened, how do you think leader, leadership actually affects the outcome when, when so much is changing and there's mm -hmm. so much uncertainty? Yeah, well, I think, um, I think as we look at many of the challenges the world faces, um, I think we'd probably all agree that there have been multiple situations where global leadership has been found wanting <laughs> um, and that perhaps different leadership or different leaders um, may have been favourable. Um, but 
But having said that, I think that leadership in times of great uncertainty um, is all the more challenging. And, and as I was saying, you know, that notion that they don't necessarily always have the answer is really important because I think it's, if we reflect on the last two or three years in the world, if someone had told you the next two or three years would look like this, I don't think we would have believed it. I, I think we would have thought, you know, it's a, it's a plot for a movie, it's too much, you know, it's too extreme. Um, and yet here we are, you know, the world has had the challenges, obviously, of COVID, but also the geopolitical uncertainty, climate change, these, these sort of really global challenges um, that are coming at us, multiple challenges all at once. Um, and so I think that notion that you don't necessarily have all the answers, you're authentic, you're open, I think is all the more important. But there's no doubt that decisions do have to be made and decisions are made based on the information you have at the time, you can look back and, and decide and, and view decisions as potentially not, you know, you wouldn't have done that if you'd known then what you know now, but you didn't. And so the ability to be decisive, take in information, make decisions um, as needed, I think is very challenging in times of uncertainty, but actually, actually all the more important. As somebody who's lived in so many different places and who's lived through this pandemic in a, several different places, mm -hmm. How do you think leadership changes from culture or countries? Do you think it's do you think it's more cultural, or do you think it's like the leadership is more a personal thing, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with whether you're you know a certain type of leadership style works better in Asia or Europe, or how do you think the cookie crumbles in terms of leadership across different locations? From what, especially, yeah, look, I definitely think. Now. Yeah, I definitely think as you move around the world, you see the impact of culture. Culture obviously has huge implications for leadership. I mean, even down to how hierarchy is viewed in different parts of the world. Do you know what I mean? Like the ability to challenge hierarchy is different in some cultures than it is in others. Um, I think you see the impact of, particularly in the context of COVID, et cetera, you see the impact of things like politics and political ambition and, and sort of differing um, pressures that people feel under politically, having had an impact on decisions that have been made. So I think there's no doubt that um, things, you know, things have played out very differently in different parts of the world, in part because of the leadership model and the leadership style we've seen people have. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a simple answer to which is best. Um, I think if you look at something like COVID and you were to sort of say which parts of the world have done better or worse, firstly, people wouldn't agree on the answer. Um, I think, you know, different people would have different views on what good looks like. And secondly, their answer wouldn't be the same all the time. The answer would be different a year ago than it would now. And so I don't think it's easy to sort of say there's one model that's been the best. Um, I think, though, that, uh, again, personally, where I've seen leadership that is um, transparent, open to information, um, authentic, acknowledging when they don't necessarily know or don't have all the answers, um, willing to change, willing to admit that mistakes have been made, for example. Um, I, I think those are important qualities. Um, as I said, though, that's different in different parts of the world, depending on culture, political pressure, as well as the individual attributes of any, of any person who finds himself in a leadership role during this time. So... You know, we live in such a global wor world, and I guess I want to take this question in two ways, right? The first is, as somebody who's entered a different culture, how do you learn about what's possible to do in that culture when you enter in a leadership role? And also, how do you manage as a leader when, you're, when your constituency and the people you're leading are not just those where you are, but also from a global or external perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think your first question about leading in, in different cultures is, is really important. Um, I think one of the skills that is really underestimated with leadership is listening. I know that sounds quite obvious, but I think often people who are senior either think they should be doing most of the talking or the other people in the room think they'll be doing most of the talking. And I actually think that leadership um, is often strengthened by really, really good listening. And so certainly in my own experience as I've moved into different roles or into different parts of the world, I've tried very hard when I arrive to listen um, and, and, you know, take advice. It's just advice. You don't need to do what people say. But, you know, ask questions, take advice, just observe 
um, and not rush into necessarily dominating a situation. Um, I also think that, you know, there are other people who you, you can observe other people who've been successful or not in that setting, talking to them or talking to others who have observed them about what worked, what hasn't. Um, but I think just being open and demonstrating you're open that things may be done differently, um, I think is really important. Uh, and I think that point about listening is true, not just when you come into different cultures or a new role, but I think generally um, listening is under, underestimated for leaders. I think, as I said, they really often feel that they do need to be doing most of the talking. And I can certainly recall, you know, three or four moments in my career where I've seen a leader really, really stop and listen. Um, and in some ways how disconcerting it was initially as a more junior person to be like, why aren't they saying anything? Um, but ultimately seeing the value of the insight they brought being enhanced by the fact that I think they've just been sitting there listening, observing, formulating their thoughts and ultimately making a very powerful contribution, just not doing it by dominating the conversation. Maybe. Okay. So do you think, you know, you talk about listening and I guess one of the reasons a lot of leaders don't like to listen is because they're so dominating or they're going forward. But on the flip side of that, what's the relationship do you think between leading and following? And is there a moment to be a follower and not to be a leader, even if you are the leader? And how do you, you know, how do you think about these two different ideas or roles and also the idea of teamwork? Mm -hmm. So my short answer would be absolutely yes. Um, I think that uh, leadership is about working towards the best and strongest outcome. It doesn't necessarily mean being the person who got you there, if that makes sense. Um, I I'm absolutely comfortable and convinced that the best idea often comes from not the most senior person in a room. Um, the best, I you know, the best ideas can come from more junior people. It happens all the time. And the role of the leader there, I think, is to give some space to let ideas be developed, flourish, et cetera, potentially help in facilitating something to be executed or, or helping to refine the idea, but not necessarily being the one who's going to say this is the great, this is the great idea. And I think certainly you can follow people's other, other ideas. I, I think personally I feel like I benefited when I was I mean, right through my career, but certainly when I was in more junior roles, when senior people gave me the opportunity, particularly in the context of um, client relationships, where they might say, I mean, I was in consulting, so obviously client relationships were very important. And they might say, you know, look, you've got good chemistry with this person, or I've seen you've got a great relationship. Why don't you work with them on this element of the project? You know, like, why don't you lead here? Recognizing that someone more junior than them had a capacity or a capability that could ultimately be used to get the team to the best outcome, it wasn't necessarily that person. I think the ability of a leader to step back and let others lead or to let others have opportunity um, is actually rarer than it should be. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, you sort of hear about insecure overachievers being in leadership roles, but I think that sort of self-assurance to really step back and create the space for other people in your team, other people in your organisation, even though you're in a senior role, um, is not just valuable toward to achieving the outcome but actually very important for the development of those people in your organization as well and certainly I feel like I benefited from people doing that for me so let's let's switch the lens and um do you think you think like this because you're a woman <laughs> um I don't I don't know because I've always <laughs> been a woman I haven't had the experience of uh of, of other perspectives um do I, I mean, look, if you're going to speak in, if we're going to make generalizations about type A personalities, they're probably seen as aligning more with traditionally masculine attributes. Having said that, I've seen women who behave like that, and I've seen men who were quite capable of, of doing the opposite. So I wouldn't want to ascribe it just to gender. Um, I do think that uh, there is value in having a broader bench, a more diverse bench of leaders. Um, and certainly having worked in medicine, in consulting and finance, they're three industries where leadership is male dominated. And I think all three benefit from uh, growing the bench of leaders, increasing diversity and gender is not just one, but a very, very important lens, I think, along which that should be done. 
I think it's really funny because it's not, I, you see me laughing because um, mm. or sparking or giggling because, you know, two women on a panel and the question always has to come around at some point to women and women's issues. Yeah. And that's great. But always, I think I have the same view of how do you even enter this topic without it being, wait, are women that different? Are we, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, just because we're biologically different, it doesn't mean that we have to be different in so many ways. But at the same time, of course, you know, our, what's shaped us is often um, is different. And mm -hmm. we do see very clear numbers that show you know, a difference in how many women have managed to make it to leadership roles or, you know, how women are represented across society in so many different ways. And so I guess the question I want to ask is why, and I, perhaps without getting, like making you explain women's issues 101 and let's just make the assumption that everybody has some working knowledge of this why do you think what's holding women back gosh it's um i mean that is a very very complicated that's an answer with a, a simple answer with a very complicated um a very complicated answer um if i was going to try and and sort of be succinct i think i think that Often when we think about leadership, uh, and this is not by no means the only reason, okay, there, as I said, it's multifactorial, you know, et cetera. Um, I do think we tend to ascribe leadership quality to traditionally more masculine ways of doing things. Um, you know, the uh, assertiveness, dominance, all these sorts of things would, would generally be seen as, as more masculine qualities. Um, in my own experience, I would say that the things that I benefited enormously from are that um, I had tremendous sponsorship along the way. Um, and, and it's worth noting that it was from men. I, I, I have not in my professional career had a strong female mentor. That's in part because, as I said, you know, the three air, the sort of three sectors I've worked in, there aren't that many senior women around, and so <laughs> it's just the maths of the situation. Um, but I have had tremendous mentorship and uh, people who've really taken a personal interest in me, who have created real opportunity for me, uh, who have given me, have taken the time to give me really tough. I mean, I want to say it was constructive, but really tough feedback. Um, but then work with me on doing better in those areas. Um, so I feel like I got a degree of um, sort of personal attention, you know what I mean, that really pulled me through in my different professional settings. And I certainly know plenty of women and men who've been sort of middle mid-career who struggled to find that. Um, and I think that if we want to see more women come through, we need to ensure that we are doing that. And certainly as I've thought about the mentors who were special to me, when I think about how do you say thank you for that, it's about trying to pay it forward and have the impact on, you know, and it won't be more than two or three or four other people the way those people had impact on me um, because I think that's, I think that's incredibly important. Um, I do, so the first thing, as I said, is, you know, leadership attributes really being sort of traditionally more masculine. I do think, and again, this is just my own experience, when I reflect on the way in which we often work in these settings, whether it's the intensity of the work, the travel demands of the work, there isn't very much flexibility in that. We haven't really changed the way, you know, the ways in which we work. And it'll be very interesting to see what, if any, lasting impact COVID has because the way we work has been so fundamentally transformed for everybody the last two years. Um, but if, again, I mean, I again reflect on myself. Um, I, I had children later in life, you know, which meant that I did I did work those hours, travel, all those sorts of things with no constraint um, for a long time. And certainly, I'll tell you that when I did have kids, it became a lot tougher, just in terms of figuring out, particularly with a husband who was also very professionally engaged, um, how to do that. So I think also, can we find real sources of flexibility in the way we work 
to give people um, more of an ability to combine family life and work life. But it is really important to me to underscore, I don't just think the challenges women have in the workplace are just about children. Um, partly because I had children later, I can think of situations or scenarios I found myself in pre-children where I felt that being female was a disadvantage in certain situations and I didn't have children. <laughs> so it wasn't just about that, although there's no doubt that family adds complexity. Um, but I do think that we need to think about can we really change the ways in which we work? What does flexibility mean? Can people be given the same opportunity, progress the same if they're not necessarily engaged in the sort of traditional way um, as well as thinking about what does leadership mean and what are the qualities of strong leaders and how can we find leaders that don't necessarily look like the leaders we have, but as I said, are more diverse. Um, and I think those things are really hard to do right. despite I mean very, very good intention from a lot of people and a lot of organizations. How much of the problem do you think is related to the workplace and how much of the problem do you think is related to culture in general? So this idea of A attributes being male aside, how much of what keeps women from moving forward and really driving towards putting their career front and center, how much of that do you think is just, you know, I, I, I live in a patriarchy still. And I, um, I always jokingly say, you know, my grandfather had no sons. I, my parents got divorced when I was young. So I, I live with my mother and I've always, so I've basically had female lineage that's very, very strong and girl, like girl power has run through these generations by necessity. But, you know, I, I live in a patriarchy and on most of my friends, a lot of my family, the women don't work and they're, they're, born and bred to be mothers and to be wives. Um, so, you know, in your opinion, perhaps, you know, coming from the West, that's not quite so patriarchal. Do you think, so I would say in Hong Kong, the patriarchy then falls from the culture into the workplace, right? Whereas in the West where it's more balanced perhaps, or the patriarchy is not so strong now, now I'm, but, but yeah, how much do you think of it is workplace and, and culture? I think the two are very hard to pull apart because I think the workplace exists in different cultures. Um, I mean, again, as I was saying, I don't think it's just about children. I think just even the, the challenge of having, having two really flourishing careers in one household is, is difficult. The demands that are that put on people around hours to work, travel to do, um, you know, we can reflect on technology, how we're all engaged 24-7, you know, so there's constant sort of demands and that's very hard even in two career households because I know a number of households where the woman is the dominant career person um, and that, that works well for that, very well for that family, but it is still that it's one, not two in, mm -hmm. in, terms, of, in terms of people in that household. Um, I, think, I think the short answer is both culture and the workplace um, are somewhat accountable. Are somewhat accountable for this. Um, as I was talking about earlier, I think more flexibility, etc., is needed. But we need to think fundamentally about our operating models and our business models in these different sectors to sort of go: how could they be adjusted? Um, I think it's a fair assumption that while the intensity may vary in different parts of the world world the patriarchy as you call it is is the norm in in many parts of the world albeit perhaps more intense in some places than others so on that note let's let's move towards work culture um you know we're, we see the covid great covid reset in china uh tangping or lying flat um the great resignation i mean all of these forces over the last few years we see people pushing back against work and about 24 seven work or 996 work as a culture do you think we work too much um probably i mean again not not one simple answer plenty of people probably would say no some but i think there's a i think if we look at how much we work my i suspect and i'm not a historian that it has increased it's just ticked up and up and up and up um I think that, I mean, someone gave me, said this to me about COVID about a year ago, and I thought it was quite a good line, which they said, COVID is like an x-ray. It shows you what's broken. Um, in that it has just put a lot of pressure 
on a lot of things, both at a social level, in at a family level, at an individual level, at a workplace level, where there was tremendous pressure and just the downward addition of COVID <laughs> has opened up some of the cracks. Um, and I think there are a lot of people uh, who probably felt, you know, they were running the rat race, if you know what I mean, and, and, that, and that with the pressure of COVID or the fact that COVID took so much away from their daily life that it, it sort of induced a bit of a reflection about what am I doing and how do I want to live and the balance they had between the amount they were doing to work, um, it just it felt like it was out of whack. I, I think it's important to note, though, that for a lot of people, that reflection is difficult because you have to work, <laughs> just in terms of the economic reality many people live under. Um, and so while I think there is a, a much broader reflection in the community, and I must say, having been in Australia, the UK, Hong Kong, the US, I see this reflection happening everywhere. I don't think this is just in, in one country or another or one paradigm or another. Um, I think it's important to recognise some people don't really have the luxury to do as much reflection as others. But so is it the company's fault or is it, again, the culture and just the competition that we create for ourselves within the workplace because we're all trying to get ahead? Where does this overwork come from? I think some of it is that, again, I think it's a little bit of everything. I, I don't think, I think we're all sort of, when we're in these kind of commercial, you know, situations, we all want to do well. There's a, there's a pressure to be the best or to, to outperform. Um, there's the capacity to do it, you know, with technology, technology connectivity, with flights, you know, dashing around the world as we used to. Um, and so there's sort of a sense of more, 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 because, the more was there for the taking, if you know what I mean, and, and that people were pushing for, you know, one more sale, one more success, you know, one more launch, whatever it, whatever it was. Um, I think, again, when I reflect on, on being in the sectors I've been in, consulting in the sort of corporate world, um, you know, I think there is that, that pressure from organisations as well as individuals, as well as the individuals who go into those sorts of jobs um, I mean, I sort of joke that, you know, when I was a teenager, my mother used to have to tell me to stop doing my homework. You know, like lots of people talk about their parents telling them to do their homework. I always was like engaged and enjoyed it and, you know, wanted to get more out of it. What could I do that was extra, et cetera. So some of it also is, you know, being a bit type A. Um, but again, I think just this, this sort of handbrake that the world had with COVID of um, showing that we can work in very different ways. I mean, I think it will be, very interesting as travel does return to the world, what happens to expectations of work travel? You know, we've all, we know now that we can do a lot of things online that we didn't think we could. I suspect the pendulum will still swing a fair way back towards where it was in terms of let's do things in person. Um, maybe not as far as it was, but generally back in that direction. Um, it'll be interesting to see what, if any of these changes are lasting. Uh, and I think that the biggest force for lasting change is actually going to be people voting with their feet. I mean, anecdotally, I certainly hear stories of Wall Street firms all around the world. You know, these firms operate globally where they're just finding fewer people are applying for their jobs because people are, talent is making a choice um, that they want to work in a different way. Now, there have been multiple iterations of this. You know, there was a period when the tech companies grew and, you know, working in an environment where you could bring your dog to work and there was free snacks and, you know, sort of a different workplace environment was very compelling for a time. Um, more flexibility, I think, is going to be very compelling. So I think if there is a force that will really push change, it'll be if the talent demands it and right. basically says when we reject this working model and certainly there's been in the news high-profile firms saying you need to back, be back in the office five days a week and high-profile firms saying you either never have to come back or you can come back one day a week. And it'll be interesting to see if those firms and those sectors ultimately start getting different outcomes in terms of where talent wants to go. It's interesting. So, like, over the past few years, um, you know, as we sit here in COVID, in year one, I didn't notice this. And what I realized by the end of the first year is I hadn't taken a single day off. 
and things were so busy. Mm -hmm. You know, we worked through weekends, we worked through public holidays and you just kept on going and going and going. And so by year two of COVID, it became a management priority at our company, given what we were seeing, especially around mental health. Um, luckily, everybody stayed quite physically healthy, but you know, was, was taking a very active approach and reminding people that, hey, stress is a problem, mental wellness is a problem. And now it becomes our role as managers and leaders, not just to say, you've got to meet these KPIs. And by the way, I realize we just lost an entire month of sales or production due to COVID, but we still have to hit that original number. But by the way, can you make sure to take a holiday too? Because you look really mm -hmm. tired. So mm -hmm. how do you, you know, as, as a leader, how do you balance all of these different needs? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you touch on a very, very good point. And that I think what the workforce has seen to need has really evolved or changed rapidly over the last couple of years. Because what you describe in terms of never taking a day off, I think when people were basically trapped in their living room, they could work online. Whatever whatever line had existed between work and home disappeared. Um, it, it happened to an extent that I think surprised people and the cost was very real, as you say, over time. Uh, and it is hard to say to people, take a holiday when they're like, I can't go anywhere. What am I going to do? I may as well work, you know, et cetera. I think one of the most important things is leading by doing. Um, seeing leaders actually say, I'm taking the week off um, and really taking the week off because I think, one, you need to reassure people that it's okay to do. You know, when there was so much pressure in the system around how busy people were to see senior people say, look, I need a holiday, I'm taking a holiday, I think is important. Um, I think we have to be real as, as, you know, teams, you know, members of teams say they're taking holidays. Don't send them the cheeky email on the Wednesday saying, Hey, I know you're on holiday, but, um, and I think, again, that comes back to being authentic in terms of sort of putting you, you know, letting your actions align with what you're saying, I think is really, um, really important. Um, and, and I think that's, I think that's actually probably the most important thing. I think when it comes to broader pressures and mental health and those sorts of things, I think talking about it's important. Not, obviously not everyone's going to be comfortable with that, but I, I've certainly heard of some situations where leaders in firms or senior people in firms have been very upfront about their own struggles, be it how difficult they've found it to balance their family life, um, be it their own mental health, be it physical issues or, you know, dealing with older parents or whatever the, whatever the pressures these people might be feeling, but talking about it and creating a space where it's okay to say, you know, we're not all superhuman, we all feel this stuff. So I think, again, as I've said a few times, I think this authenticity thing is really important and leaders being seen as credible human beings um, and acknowledging that they struggle with some of this stuff, acknowledging that they need a holiday too and taking it um, and being genuine in their support of employees. Uh, and ensuring that they don't have a situation where they're seen as paying lip service to you need a break or lip service to mental health, um, but not letting up on the demands that are being put on people. Um, okay, well, we are at 6.35. And so we're going to go to Slido questions in five minutes. Okay. I get one more question. And um, my last question will be, and I, we've covered a lot of things in the last half hour or so, you know, starting from the global pandemic, talking sort of touching on global issues, women, um, workplace culture, mental health. What are the areas that you think are most ripe or in need of leadership right now? Uh, globally? Wh whatever you see, wherever yeah. you see well, it. Yeah. I think that um, one of my great disappointments of the last couple of years is that humanity is facing some challenges that really do require global coordination. You know, it's not about I'm from this country or that country or this political party or that political party. Um, and yet we're not doing a very good job of figuring these things out together. And actually you might have thought that a health crisis one in which we're all impacted because we're human, not because we're of any nationality or anything like that, might have actually helped the world go, wow, this is a real problem, let's figure it out together. And sadly, we obviously haven't done that. Whether it's on, you know, the political back and forth about where did this come from, 
the lack of a glo effective global vaccine rollout, you know, all sorts of things that I think the world could have done better on. I think that's a real shame. Um, and we obviously have other big challenges, whether it's climate change, um, some of the geopolitical fractures that we see, uh, and the world seems to be pulling apart on some of these things rather than pulling together. The flip side of that, I'd say, is that for all of the challenges, I think science has had a pretty incredible two years, just in terms of what science has shown it can do. Um, and so my faith is that, you know, we do have, humanity does have the capacity to solve big problems um, relatively quickly, um, but also, you know, in a really impressive fashion. Uh, and so I have hope that we can come together and figure these things out. But as I look ahead at the damage climate change is doing to the world, um, I do think that there will be another pandemic sooner rather than later. <laughs> um, I would love to see more openness and collaboration amongst world leaders. And, um, and I don't just mean political, I mean all, you know, all sorts of leaders, um, because I think we've got big problems that need big solutions. Great. All right. So let's go to the questions and let's start with what advice do you have for women early in their finance careers with leadership aspirations? Mm -hmm. um, the two things that when I reflect on my career, the two things that I think I got right, and a lot of it was good luck, not good management. So please don't think that I had some master plan. Um, one is I took some risks. So I was a doctor. Um, I then joined McKinsey and became a finance person at McKinsey. And then I obviously went to BlackRock. Um, some of those choices seemed a bit odd when I made them. Uh, and what drove them for me was sort of intellectual curiosity and I wanted to try something else. Um, but it did mean that I, I sort of pushed open a few doors for myself that weren't obvious. And so I think particularly early in your career, be willing to take a chance. Um, I'm not suggesting being reckless. I'm just saying that um, seek out different opportunities, seek out different people to work with, um, and, and don't think you necessarily have to have a five-year plan that you stick to religiously. Uh, the second thing, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, is I think mentorship's really invaluable. And I know a lot of people struggle with necessarily, you know, how do I find a mentor? I don't think you can just assume the mentor will come looking for you. Uh, um, I think you have to go looking for them. Uh, and so, for example, and I think mental relationships, like any relationships, you need to have good chemistry. So I think that there are some very well-intended sort of programs in various organisations to match people with mentors. And I think those programs are important because I think it says the organisation values mentorship and I think it gives everyone a chance to practice. But I do think it's important as you go along, if there are senior people you feel you have a good connection with, or if there are people whose career paths or areas of work you're very compelled by, reach out to them. I think saying to someone I think of you as something of a mentor is very flattering to hear. Uh, and I don't think you can just sort of walk the hallways and be like, here I am, mentor me. Because I don't think the mentors are going to come looking for you necessarily. The other thing I'd say on mentors is it doesn't have to be the most senior person. It doesn't have to be someone with grey hair. Um, some of the most effective mentors I had along the way were people who were just two or three years ahead of me, who I think had very good recollection and perspective on the position I was in because it was fairly recent for them versus someone who's 25 years ahead of me in their career. And while I no doubt have a lot of value they can add, the experience they may have had at my stage could have been quite different just because of the passage of time. So the two things I'd say is look for new opportunities. It doesn't have to be the fastest way to get the promotion, but just be intellectually curious and open to trying different things to broaden your own experience. And secondly, be very proactive about not just receiving mentorship, but seeking it out. That's great. Um, so to a mid-career question, mm -hmm. are there any books that you felt changed your perspectives on working in finance that you would recommend to women in their mid-career mid stages? Short answer, no. I'm not, I, I wouldn't say that I have, I, I'm not someone who's read things along the way that, that really changed my perspective. I mean, I'm very much one of the lean in generation, which is that that book came out sort of when I was more sort of mid-career and there was a lot in that book I didn't like. <laughs> what I did like about it was that I thought it really got people talking about women in the workplace. I actually remember when the book first came out, I was a bit, hand, you know, hands off reading it. 
And I had, I remember it was 15 people asked me what I thought about the book in two days. And I was like, well, I'm going to have to read this book because I need to have a perspective on it. Um, so I wouldn't say there is a single book that gave me, um, that gave me pause. Uh, that, that just hasn't been a source of, you know, it's been more people rather than sort of the books along the way that have really moved me. But what I did like about some of those books is they got the conversation going. Um, I think... As I said, for me, it's been more about seeking out some more unusual opportunities and really looking for mentors um, who are going to be honest and direct and consistent for me. So you talk a lot about different opportunities and how you've been between different um, mm -hmm. roles and areas. How have you leveraged or utilized, and specifically you said your medical background in the finance field, but any of your backgrounds in the other fields? Like how did they all interplay? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's funny with medicine because I do say that uh, in both consulting and finance, medicine gave me very good perspective that nobody was dying <laughs> because obviously in medicine that had actually been the case. Um, but look, I think, I think there was a few things. Look, there are, there are some parallels. I mean, I used to say there were parallels between medicine and consulting, you know, in that in medicine, you're obviously dealing with a, an individual and with a, a diagnostic or surgical situation. But, you know, you are sort of, there's a problem, you know, you ask lots of questions, you try and get a bit of a list of differentials, you do some tests to test those various hypotheses. I mean, you can see some parallels with the, the consulting approach. So there was some sort of, um, there was some sort of, of carry across. Um, I think the most important thing was the moving between different things and I had some really wobbly moments when it didn't feel good. I, I don't I don't want to suggest that I made these transitions and they were smooth and I never looked back and it was like, yeah, here I come. I mean, they were, some of it felt really wobbly, but I think what the transitions gave me was actually a confidence that I could do it. Um, I, I definitely, I remember sitting in some of my early engagements at McKinsey, literally writing down words in my notebook that I was going to Google when I got back to my office because I didn't understand what people were talking about. Um, but having had to do that a few times, I got confident, okay, don't worry, I'm going to have to Google a few things, do some extra reading, ask some questions, but I will get up the learning curve. I, I can do it. Um, so I think the thing it gave me in some ways more than anything was a bit of confidence in my adaptability and ability to move between things, um, even though at the, mo at the time, in the moment, some of the knowledge, some of the learning curves felt very, very steep. Um, I don't think there is a direct doing medicine made me better at BlackRock. I don't, I, don't, I don't know that there was any sort of direct carry across um, other than I've been fortunate at all these stages to be doing work that I've really enjoyed. Um, and I found that very motivating, that sort of energy from learning new things, being curious uh, and doing things in such different sectors has allowed me to do that. Um, but I think more than anything else, it's actually been a sort of confidence in my own ability to adapt more than it has been a direct content or any other sort of direct connection. I mean, I find I do that a lot too. I, I have a lot of interests and as you heard, I mean, I sit on things that range from education to art and often I find myself, you know, first meeting and it's, you've got this big stack of readings and wait, I don't know what any of these terms are and, you know, <laughs> open Google. But for me, I found that being in different fields actually I think analogously, so I'm very able to bring one type of thinking into the other. And I think it makes me a lot more creative as a person and more rigorous down a single argument path. But um, I definitely think that having more than one career or one single area of focus adds to your life and makes it so much richer. Um, all right. I completely agree. I mean, I was going to just say, I, I think we've heard a lot about the benefit of diversity in teams. I think diversity, even within your own lived experience, where you can get it, is fantastic. So I, I strongly recommend living in different parts of the world or, you know, working in, in different, different sectors or different organisations or even different parts of the same organisation because I just think that breadth of experience, even if it's difficult to directly quantify how it's additive, I'm very convinced it's additive, but that may just be because it's been my experience and therefore I'm, I'm telling myself I did the right things. <laughs> Um, let's go back to this sort of, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to combine two or three questions. And the question really is around 
authoritarian, autocratic power domination, patriarchy, and an authoritarian environment and culture. And the question is, wow. how can alternative leadership styles thrive and succeed in such an, an environment? And what urgent actions can be taken today so that 30 years from now, things will be better? Gosh. That's, that's a big one. I feel like I need a drink. Um, I, I'm, thinking, I, I'm, I'm thinking more about sort of organisations um, more than I am countries. But I answered, you know, I, I don't think this, I'm not going to get into sort of the um, power structures of, of various, you know, various uh, global superpowers. Um, look, I think that... Uh, as I said, I, I have found leadership where it's most compelling is that leaders are open to new ideas, et cetera, et cetera. I think, so I think in those situations, it's pretty obvious that if you do things in a slightly different way and it yields results, even if that's not just necessarily all the way through to the outcome, but, you know, there's stronger team participation, there's um, client interest. There are all sorts of ways success can be can be measured along that way. I think those things are pretty are pretty apparent and obvious. Um, I do think in organisations where that feels less um, less possible, I th what I would suggest is um, I think there's something about working with others, not just being an individual. So finding others who are sort of like-minded, whether it's that they're like-minded about how something should be done, whether it's they're like-minded about the content, whether it's they're like-minded about the outcome they want to see um, and, and sort of creating something of a, uh, a sort of coalition or a union there, I think, is is important. Um, I think ultimately, as I, I spoke earlier, where possible, you know, voting with one's feet around what kind of organisation do you want to be part of, what kind of leadership or, t or team or leadership do you find compelling and do you want to be working with, I think, you know, ultimately where you can, voting with your feet. So I think there are different ways to do that. Um, but I do think ultimately... It is to the benefit of organisations that we don't see leadership defined as a one-dimensional thing, that there's one way to do it. Um, and it's important we create and foster organisations where different styles can ultimately be successful. Okay, so as we get to the end, um, I guess we should do something a little bit more optimistic and ask, Geraldine, what are you excited by right now? Oh, gosh, um, lots of things. I mean, as I said, like, COVID has definitely, um, I personally definitely felt a loss of various things through COVID, um, particularly having been someone who's lived in different parts of the world, the loss of the ability to move around, to see family and friends, et cetera. Um, and so I am, while we're certainly not through COVID, in some many parts of the world, and I recognise this isn't the case in, in all parts of the world, including Hong Kong, we are more able to move around in a way that feels a bit more like it used to, um, albeit with masks, lots of PCR testing, all sorts of things. That reconnecting with people and places, um, I think I appreciate far more than I did three years ago because it was taken away. So um, seeing family, seeing friends, seeing places that are special um, is very exciting. Um, my family's in the process of, of relocating to the UK. And while that's a bit daunting, um, there are lots of things about being here that I'm excited by. Um, as I said, you know, I think science has had a remarkable, um, a remarkable couple of years. Just yesterday, I was at a, at a function where there was a number of very senior members of the Oxford team who developed the AstraZeneca vaccine and talking to people like that about what they'd achieved, but what they saw as the challenges of the next few years was incredibly energizing, as I said, just about science and the world and what people can do and, and the energy and focus people are bringing to it. Um, so lots of things, be they small personal things or much bigger geopolitical things, um, I'm, I'm very excited about. But as my husband says to me, he says, I'm a relentless optimist. So I'm always someone who's finding sort of things to be excited about. Okay, well, I actually think we have one more question. We have time for one more question. And somebody did not follow the rules and did not send this question to Slido, but somehow sent it to Zoom. And so since it's right <laughs> in front of me, I'm going to ask this one. What could high achieving and high potential women do to find more senior, including board roles? 
What have been the most effective channels in your career or in those you've seen around you? Mm -hmm. um, I think two things that come to mind. The first is um, I think it's really important to have a network, to meet people. You know what I mean? Like some, you know, you never be out and about talking to people, have the lunch. And it doesn't have to be senior people. You never know when, uh, when people will move into more senior roles, um, when they might be in an organisation you're particularly interested in. So I think it's important to really be focused on building network over time. The other thing is I think it's important to tell people you're interested. Um, again, I think sometimes we make assumptions that, oh, well, if they thought I could be good, they'd ask me. No, not necessarily. Like tell some, and that, that doesn't mean they will ask you. But if you tell people that you're interested in board roles or you're interested in getting involved with an NGO, you're interested in doing something in the arts, et cetera, um, even if it's not immediate, I think that, that makes it more likely that person will think of you in the future. Um, and so I think, and again, generalisations, I do think women have a bit of a tendency to be more reserved in this. Um, I think it's important that in the right way you put it out there, that you're open and interested. Um, so that there's no there's there's less room for confusion about oh I didn't think you'd be up for it or whatever, um, and I think we can be a little bit more front footed about that. Um, I watched one of your panels that was on YouTube as I prepped for today. Oh and gosh, was, I think you were speaking maybe for something about the Wall Street Journal, perhaps. And okay. in it, you talk about how when you were at BlackRock, you were you needed to travel a lot because your partner traveled a lot. And you just mm -hmm. told Larry that you were often not going to be there on Fridays. And I think, you know, what I've learned from you today and from listening to your other speeches or videos is that really it's about being assertive and it's about thinking about knowing what you want and then being willing to speak up on, on behalf of yourself and put it out there that this is what you want and you know, going for it. So I'm really happy that um, we went for it and we asked you and we managed to get you today to come and chat with us amidst your very chaotic travel schedule. Um, I know you just got to London like three days ago. So big jet time. lagged children. It's ugly. Jet lagged kids and a new yeah. home. <laughs> um, so, but yeah. thank you so much, Geraldine. This was really fun. No worries. And you know, hopefully we'll get to do this again live. I look forward to it. Thanks so much for having me, Dee. Okay. I am so um, happy that we asked too. I want to thank uh, for, for this program. Uh, we could not have done it without uh, the help of uh, Margie suggesting it and putting us in touch with Geraldine and this network, uh, I, the, you know, Asia Society Hong Kong, as well as Asia Society Globally as a wonderful network. And I'm just so grateful for the two of you as executive director of Asia Society Hong Kong. Um, I'm really grateful to Janet for agreeing to uh, co-host uh, this program with us, uh, despite being quarantined. And we're all being creative and making uh, adjustment and adapting uh, to this time of change. And so thanks, Steve, and thanks, Geraldine, for um, taking time from your busy schedule. Um, it's been, um, I find that with COVID, uh, we've learned to do things differently. So even though the Asia Society is close until the 21st of April, we are still doing, bring, be able to bring you a really thought-provoking program type tonight. And we will continue to do so. In fact, one of the programs coming up is going to be Professor Catherine Sun, uh, who is a psychologist. And uh, Professor Sun is going to talk about uh, mental health here, especially how we're going to deal with it in Hong Kong. Um, so we're going to have Professor Sun April 19th. Um, I think this is time Hong Kong needs us. And I think uh, we're going to be doing some great programs. And I think uh, another program coming up again with ABC, uh, with uh, Janet, we're going to be talking to uh, James, uh, James Falk, whose new book, Financial Cold War, uh, will be, uh, the program will be coming up um, next week. And so please stay tuned. And again, thank you both. And I'm Really proud that, uh, in fact, uh, when Jodine was talking, I'm going to ask, and she may say no, but when she was talking, um, I've been meaning for our COVID update, we've been talking to really wonderful scientists, including um, uh, some of the scientists in, in uh, UK. So since you met the AstraZeneca people in Oxford, I would love to invite you uh, and to be moderating a talk like that, uh, hearing from uh, what are some of the stuff that has been learned at this last two years. I think, what you, as you said, 
um, science has been one of the breakthroughs and in and, and some ways almost uh, one of the few optimistic things that we can look forward to. So since you're in UK and the time zone, if we can work it out, I'm going to ask and you can always say no, uh, but it is really times like this that we have time to learn. Um, I think your, your, your talk about intellectual uh, curiosity is something that's near, it's part of Asia society's um, a, a modus of operandi and as well as mentorship. Um, it's something that I truly, truly couldn't agree with you more. And uh, so, um, but before I, I had a question uh, that, that I wanted to ask you before we, we, we sign off. Uh, what are some of the advice um, a mentor has given you that you still kind of give to your mentees? Um, is there something I can ask you, uh, Geraldine, to, to answer that question? I've always been curious. Sure. Um, I mean, I think when I think about my strongest professional mentor and I think about um, the threads of conversation, <clears throat> and he's been a mentor of mine now for well over a decade, and I think about the threads that we have, um, I think one of them that comes up the most is actually confidence, that I, that I have to have more confidence in myself. And I think people who know me might sound, that might sound odd because they may think I project like I have confidence. Um, but I think we all have these moments of real insecurity and not being overwhelmed by them and sort of trying to create that voice in your head that says, no, this is one of those moments, keep going. Um, but I think that's definitely been a thread that, uh, a thread that has been um, constant constant for me. Well, thank you for that great advice. Um, no Lindsay, because we've been asked to speak at, to a lot of high school students because we're using this opportunity mm -hmm. to make ourselves available. And, and I, I like asking this question because my uh, advice from my mentor when I was uh, my first boss was never burn your bridges. So I, I like getting um, organizing, collecting these advice. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask the same of, of, of Dee as well. Dee, do you have any advice on that front? Um, I think the best advice that I've ever gotten is that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So as long as you can keep on running, you're still in the game. And it's, you know, it gets really, really hard, but slow down a bit, just keep running. And one day you'll get to the end. Great advice. And it really mirror our exhibition, Recovery, Resilience and, uh, and Resurgence. So I think that the message of resilience uh, is something that we here in Hong Kong know very well these days. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a tough couple of months still, but I think hopefully uh, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and, uh, but I think, thank you both. And thank all of us, uh, all of you for joining us, wherever you are. I know with programs like this, we now get uh, an audience from our our European centers, as well as our Asian center as, and maybe even our, our um, uh, US centers uh, when they can watch a rebroadcast. So thank you both. And thank you all for joining us and have a safe, um, a safe Qingming festival. I, you know, in some ways, uh, what is a weekend these days and what is a holiday? Tomorrow is a public holiday in Hong Kong and do take a rest and do take care of yourself. Thank you all.